go, if you don't mind, with a shorter okay, version, please. just because right. otherwise it's, it's fine. Kind of... Thank you. So sorry that for missing the first version of the introduction. So we say we are very lucky to have Professor James Ryan with us, who's uh, been publishing books since uh, 1997 uh, with uh, books to do with geography, uh, but photography and geography in a historical sense. So space and technology, especially in the colonial world, and when it comes to the British Empire and also other colonial uh, empires implications. And um, originally, <laughs> I was saying also that one of the first uh, positions, uh, not the first one, one of the first long-term positions from Professor uh, Ryan was as Associate Professor of Human and Cultural Geography and Director of the Center for Geography, Environment and Society at the University of Exeter until uh, 2017, when then moved to uh, the VNA, the Victorian Albert Museum, when he became the head of postgraduate programs and led the VNA and RCA MA in History of Design and the HRC Collaborative Doctoral Partnership Program for the VNA. Since 2021, he is a professor of history and head of the School of Area Studies, History and Politics and Literature at the University of Portsmouth. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I, I find it. Uh, quite hard, quite a challenge to get time to do research uh, as a head of school. I know any of you who've been head of school or are head of school, you 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 know what that the uh, the pressures of those sorts of roles are like. So I'm very grateful to you for sort of forcing me to um, uh, to do this and and um, persisting with your your invitation. Um, I'm probably I'll just for the colleagues online. I might uh, I like usually like moving about, but I'll but I'll be interrupting the screen, so I might just stay here actually. Then. Then people online can can see me, but if that's if that's okay. So um, so thank you for getting the the technology uh, working. Um, I I hope you can see this picture to start. Um, so I'm going to start with this uh, oil painting uh, by uh, a well-known Victorian painter called Thomas Baines. Uh, it's called uh, Outspan Under Mucheri Tree Between Kobe and Lake Ngami. Uh, it was painted in 1861. Uh, and it shows set within a wide landscape uh, centered around a large tree. Um, a number of characters set out on the colonial stage under a, uh, a, a blazing overhead sun. You can't quite see the, in, the original picture is incredibly bright. Um, the colours really, really uh, pop out at you. Um, there's a number of characters. I won't go into the painting in great detail, but there's a whole number of characters who were recognisable um, to uh, ethnographers and anthropologists um, uh, in, in the 1860s. Uh, there were groups of um, ethnically recognisable um, groups from um, Southwest Africa. Uh, there are um, the white explorers caravans in the in the background and there's a group of um of indigenous uh, men and women here um uh carving up a um a uh, uh an animal uh, of some kind i'm trying to remember whether it's an, an, an elephant i think it is they're dismembering a, uh, an, an animal in fact um so in the foreground to the right is a bearded white character uh, with a, a hat who is uh, at work with glass plates and chemicals and there's a young assistant holding his camera tripod to the ground. So this is the tripod. Um, and if it wasn't, I think for that that sort of detail, there's a very bright silver or metal bucket here and there's two women with similarly bright silver metal buckets on their heads over here. Those sorts of details pop out at you very, very strongly in the painting. Um, and I think it um, otherwise perhaps it would it, it, it could be um, some kind of um, older sort of pastoral scene. But I think those those details really pop out as a as a kind of sign of um, modernity, encroaching modernity, modernity into this otherwise um, pastoral scene. Um, the art historians Jane Carruthers and Marian Arnold, who who are the, the bi main biographers of, of uh, the artist Thomas Baines, have argued that, that the camera is the key to this scene since it draws attention to the contrived nature of all image making. 
Um, and I'm interested in this process of image making in this context. That's really where this paper has come from. I'm particularly interested in the artist Thomas Baines who painted this scene, but also the photographer uh, James Chapman, who is is, is uh, painted in the corner of this uh, painting, uh, is depicted. And in fact, this happens quite a lot. The photographer photographs the the artist, and the and the painter uh, depicts the photographer, in that, and they have this relationship ongoing throughout their um, throughout their travels. Uh, so, I, I became particularly interested in this photographer and the artist Thomas Baines, um, and the photographs that James Chapman made. Uh, on a colonial uh, expedition in Southwest Africa, um, which is today Namibia and Botswana, um, in 1860 to 1864, so over a sort of three and a half, four year period. Um, the James Chapman uh, joined up with the artist Thomas Baines, um, who was Thomas Baines was very experienced as a traveller and, and a painter. He'd been on several expeditions, including the famous. Um, uh, Expedition uh, up the Zambezi with uh, the the missionary explorer hero David Livingston. Um, he, he'd been expelled from that uh, unfairly, it turned out from that that um, expedition. Um, but but he joined forces with James Chapman in a joint venture to cross the um, the continent. That was their uh, their uh, idea. They were crossing. This is a map from James Chapman's later. Um, published volume of their expedition. Expedition. They were public. They were um, planning to cross from the far west, uh, from uh, Balvis Bay, which is in um, current day Namibia, uh, on the coast, uh, to to head east across the continent uh, to get to the Victoria, what was had been named Victoria Falls by Livingston, um, in on the Zambezi. Uh, and then make their way uh, to uh, down the Zambezi to the Indian Ocean uh, uh, on the on the east coast of, of Africa. Um, they had a shared preoccupation with recording uh, all the sites, uh, the landscape, the people uh, as, as on, on their way um, and the resulting sketches, paintings, photographs and published and unpublished accounts by both uh, men show a very close association between these two individuals and their chosen respective visual arts for, uh, photography and painting um, and i'm particularly interested in the ways in which um this expedition allows the opportunity to think about um how colonial expeditionary activity in this period accommodated this modern very modern medium of photography uh, and the difference that photography made to the ways in which colonial environments and diverse human subjects um, were encountered and exposed to wider um, viewing viewing publics so that that's what I set out to try to uh, to try to understand by looking looking at that at material um, there's been quite a lot of work on uh, on Thomas Baines in particular not so much on James Chapman uh, quite little in fact given his his prominence at the time um, and so what I want to do today is just give you a, a very sort of crude summary of a longer paper uh, in which I try to um, understand this, uh, the expeditionary photographs in particular, in in terms of what um, uh, the, the 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 historian James Hevier, who's a historian of, of China actually, but um, what James Hevier has taught, has called the photography complex, and he's drawn on the work of Bruno Latour uh, in thinking about this. And what he means by that is what he calls um, quote a network of actants made up of human and non-human parts. Uh, such as the camera, optics, negatives, chemicals, um, all the way through the staggering array of reproductive technologies through which images move and circulate to the photographer, that which is photographed, transportation and communication networks along which all of these parts travel, the production and distribution networks that link faraway places to end users, and he, he, he goes on. So Hevier uses this concept of the, photogra the photography complex to question not only the uh, what he calls the ontological priority given to the photographic image, but also to consider what he calls, uh, I quote, a novel form of agency, one understood in terms of the capacity to mobilize and deploy elements for generating new material realities. The photographs, he, the photograph, he writes, is thus neither reflection nor representation of the real, but a kind of metronomic sign of the photography complex in operation. 
So I think this has really productive um, uh, possibilities. Uh, it's, it also has overlaps with the his historian uh, of, of anthropology and photography, Elizabeth Edwards, uh, who's used the heuristic device of, of performativity um, to think about the act of making, making photographs and how making photographs is a kind of social performance and photographs themselves and photography as a practice uh, perform um, as things with agency in, in the act of making history, um, where their uncontainable meanings are framed in different ways at different times and by, by different people. So um, what I then try to do in the uh, in the longer paper is to think about this practice, uh, the practice of photography on this expedition. Um, and I try to think uh, about how photographs um, in the expedition are used to, to open up this this colonial territory or this territory uh, to reconstruct it as a potential um, space for colonization. Um, this is very key to both the, the two the two main uh, the leaders of the expedition, Chapman and Baines. Um, they're very uh, keen. They have particular ambitions as geographers. They're both fellows of the Royal Geographical Society, for example. They're very keen botanists and zoologists and uh, anthropologists, they are recording everything as they uh, as they go, um, and their artistic and photographic exploits are, are attuned to those sort of scientific ways. There's increasingly um, the, the ways in which photography is being incorporated into those uh, fledgling disciplines, those, those disciplines, which are sort of at, at the moment when those disciplines like geography and anthropology are are being professionalised with with learned societies and meetings and journals and, uh, and and so on so they're very keen to be seen to be part of that and make make money but also make them sort of get their reputation established in metropolitan centers of, of science um so they have um this expedition is not a uh, a government funded expedition it's funded by um these two individuals themselves so james chapman funds it through uh, he's got a patron in London called Sir, Sir George Grey, um, who, who helps him. He also funds it through his trading um, money he's earned by trading ivory uh, in particular. So he's a colonial trader and, and prospector. So he he's funding it himself as, as through his sort of colonial businesses. Um, uh, Thomas Baines funds it by the sale of paintings, um, particularly the sale of paintings. He, he's, he, he did well uh, selling a number of paintings in uh, in uh, the, in the Cape Colony um, when they had a, a big royal visit, um, so so they're both trading. Um, they're using their skills and knowledge to to raise the money to do this, and they're sort of venturing that this expedition will then go on and and give uh, them even greater uh, credibility um, and, um, and and prospects. So uh, this I think feeds into the fact that they are very very determined. And spend a huge amount of time making images. It's not a sort of incidental pursuit. They will spend days um, at Thomas Baines painting and sketching, uh, and James Chapman making making photographs. And he talks in some um, detail about how um, he, uh, uh, both of them, talk about that their struggles in, in different ways with that with that with that technology. Um, so the. Both these people then are familiar with the aims of, of, of ex expeditions. Um, they're in tune with the requirements to extend scientific knowledge. They're both also operating at, an, this is a mid 19th century expedition um, into uh, a, a, the continent that at the time was known in Victorian popular um, culture as the dark continent. They were, um, I admit, oh, what's happened to it? Where's it gone? Somebody trying to get in. Uh, to the space, and I don't know where that's. Uh... Right, you managed to do You're it. managed to do it. Okay, right. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, so, so this is the, the, the kind of colonial nature of what they're doing is 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 key. Um, they are wanting to tap into a popular demand, a, a, a seemingly insatiable appetite in amongst Victorian audiences for stories of uh, what was known as the Dark Continent. Um, so they're very much in tune with that. Um, they, uh, by the mid 19th century, many parts of Southern Africa um, had been contested by European powers for 
um, in some cases centuries. This is a very, uh, it's not a new phenomena, uh, but this there's a speeding up uh, the scramble for Africa um, is a kind of broader, broader context. Um, and Chapman's and Bain's expedition and the written uh, written documentation, the, the cartographic printed photographic output from it all played a part in incorporating um, what is today Namibia and Botswana within a wider British sphere of influence. They're, they are um, they're very much kind of part of that. Um, the thing I think I want to stress, however, is the the complexity of the political geography of this terrain um, that they're in. Um, it's, it's the Northern Cape and South Africa have their own very complex political geography, very different to the Eastern Cape. There's less rigid racial stratification, but very complex shifting groupings of diverse communities, um, amongst whom there was fierce competition for scarce natural resources. And they're about, I mean, in his in their in his book, James Chapman Documents, there are sort of over getting on for a hundred different linguistic and ethnic groups that he encounters. So it's it's really, it's really complex. It's a highly mobile population subsisting on a dynamic economy based on livestock raiding. Um, with dominant ethnic groups, uh, and notably, notably the Orlams Afrikaners, um, who exert a semi-feudal network of power, controlling traders' access to the interior to exploit the natural resources and then feed the demand for products from the expanding colonial Cape economy. And it was across this very complex, uh, dynamic, multi-ethnic environment that the explorers, uh, these two white men and their entourage moved. Their passage often involved careful negotiation in what was an increasingly volatile political environment uh, as the Afrikaners sought to control European traders access to the interior, uh, exacting tribute for the use of the main routeways. Um, and this is this, in other words, is contested territory. Um, and the photography complex in this expedition is not is not simply sustained by sort of a state apparatus, but by these very complicated commercial, um, um, ethnic, and um, trading uh, networks uh, uh, as well. So that that's a point that I'll I'll, I'll come back to. Um, so they are ambitious then these two explorers to um, to find their way through this landscape and to chart its 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 um, its prospects. They're trying to find. Uh, in particular, um, what the best sort of route through the space is, what what what, and, and when they get to the uh, the the, um, the Zambezi River, they want to then chart its navigability, its suitability as a commercial route um, to exploit uh, this this part of sub southern central Central Africa. Um, both of them are uh, both men are reliant on the immediate colonial economy for their for their survival as well as for their longer term financial security. Both of them have vested interests in recording um, recording the expedition in words and pictures that might appeal to an audience of South, of South African colonists, as well as a wider British reading um, uh, public. So Chapman uh, goes on to his, his extensive notes and records. He's recording things all the time, uh, zoology, ethnography, ethnology, geography, geology. Um, he publishes uh, in 1868, published a two large two volume uh, book called Travels in the Interior of, of, uh, of South Africa, uh, which is an account of his 15 years journey uh, in this period. And although it's not illustrated with photographs, that, that was too expensive at the time. It's it's full of woodcuts like this, which which talk a lot about his photographs. And in particular, he's very keen to stress just how difficult it was to take his photographs, although they don't appear in the text. So this is the this is the book uh, this is the um, a woodcut classic woodcut in the text called Photography Under Difficulties, which has Chapman sort of struggling with various bits of photographic apparatus. As well, there's some kind of raid happening. Um, it's a livestock and people charging through through their their uh, uh, their camp, um, and and he he charts these various sorts of uh, these various sorts of uh, events. Uh, so. One way of looking at the photographs is very much in this sort of cartographic um, uh, sort of as a kind of mapping exercise. And some of the captions that he makes are very geographical in that way. So this is a stereoscopic photograph 
um, called The Vertical Sun or The Shadowless Man. Um, it's given a very precise date when it was taken and when it was taken at noon, uh, and it notes the latitude and longitude. Uh, and it, the idea is that the sun is directly overhead, so there is there is no shadow. Um, but it's pinpointing the um, individual. The, this is the caption that's written on the back of the uh, the back of the photograph. Um, and a num number of other photographs have have this kind of um, uh, th this kind of captioning. Um, so Chapman he he, he uses um, stereoscopic photography, which I'll I'll I'll, um, I'll I'll say more about it in in, in a moment. But um, one of the things that he's very keen to do as part of this geographical uh, this, this this sort of geographical project um, is to map is to name places so as they go along they're very keen to, to name sites that they discover it's the kind of classic european colonial project if you like so uh just one example um they um they they, they encounter a valley and they decide to name all of the geographical features in the valley after the key people in the royal geographical society so they're they're obviously trying to curry favor with their with who they see as that people who are going to sort of later going to kind of praise their voyage. So one way of doing that is to kind of name everything you see after um, after important people. So it's, there's naming, there's claiming, um, there's an attempt to um, to discover things. If not uh, to discover them, things that haven't been found before, they they want to um, they want to find new ways of, of, of um, picturing things. So. Then one of their main targets on the expedition is to get to the Victoria Falls, which uh, were supposedly, were at least um, in, in popular Victorian um, parts, were discovered by David Livingstone um, in a, a, about a decade earlier. Uh, but what Baines and Chapman want to do is, is, to, is to make a series of paintings and photograph them. So Chapman is very determined to be the first person to take a photograph. He wants to discover things photographically, uh, particularly the, Victor the Victoria Falls. Uh, so that they're, they're, he's very dedicated to that that project. Um, they do get to, they reach the Victoria Falls, uh, and James Chapman spends a long time trying to uh, take a photograph of it. And, it. and one of his photographs ends up in ends up being sent to the Royal Geographic Society. Um, and Thomas Baines spends a huge amount of time also painting the falls because he imagines a very uh, imagines a good market for these kinds of spectacular paintings. So. Baines is very much in the in the sort of um, looking in the genre of the sublime. So these are huge, you know, huge natural wonder, uh, um, loud, um, um, lots of lots of noise and um, sort of sensation of of, 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 sort of like terror and awe. He's trying to conjure that up in his paintings, and the paintings are done on gi on a gigantic scale. When you when you see James Chapman's photograph, uh, it's it's tiny. It's like that big on a little card in a filing cabinet in the Royal Geographical Society all by itself. It's murky, uh, it's not particularly dramatic. So geography wasn't always very good actually at conveying the drama that painting could do. It, it's not, it doesn't work in quite the same uh, same way. So um, that's a kind of example where, uh, where photography didn't work perhaps so well. Uh, it was also very difficult because of the the, the damp conditions. It, it it was very difficult te technically to to make the photograph. Um, so that's that's one example. Um, we just uh, there are other ways in which painting can achieve uh, things that photography can't. So what Thomas Baines could do is he could imagine by uh, his sketches and things he could combine a kind of set of multiple perspectives. So this is what uh, a view of the bird's eye view of the Victoria Falls, which of course, Thomas Baines, not a view that you could achieve in reality unless you had a, a drone uh, like today. Um, so he was combining a kind of cartographic view with a traditional landscape view. Um, and he does he, he does that, he kind of maps the falls so you can see some sense of the scale of them uh, and their, their geographical space, sort of space, um, the spacing of them. Uh, but from a distance and from a from an imagined uh, bird's eye view, which again is something that Thomas Bain, uh, that sorry, the photographer uh, wasn't so able uh, to do. It's much much harder to do. So um, Thomas Bain, Thomas Baines, of course, is using a, a sketching and, and um, painting, which again uses color. Uh, the photographer is is limited to, um, uh, to to black and white or kind of forms tones of grey. Um, 
Chapman also uses the, photog the um, technology of stereoscopic photography. I don't know if any of you are familiar with stereoscopic photography. No. Have any of you ever used a little Disney 3D viewer that you look through? OK, so you've, you've done that thing where you look through and you see a photograph in 3D. That's what this technology was. So the idea, it, it's not it's not new at this stage. It's relatively new. It, it, it's sort of um, created in the late 1850s. It really takes off big time in the 1860s. It's a it's a it's a, a sort of exciting um, technology. Chapman absorbs absorbs it, ad adopts it, decides to 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 go with it. Um, the photographs are made usually with a double barreled camera, so the camera's got two lenses, and it takes um, photographs from slightly different angles. They are combined when they're printed on these little cards. The cards are probably about this sort of this sort of size. You put them into a into a viewer, um, which uh, has like a it's like a pair of binoculars, but sort of it. They often they had sort of sides to them that plunged your 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 face into darkness. So you put the the senses of being immersed in space. It's a very different um, kind of visual technology to looking at a photograph at a distance. It's a it's an immersive one. It's a solitary experience. The the it's a single spectator looking at this, and it creates the illusion of space. Um, so it's a very different sort of technology. So there is an interesting question there about why he why he decided to, to think this was a more appropriate um, technology uh, to use. Some of his photographs are uh, designed with quite a sort of art history perspective. So these ones here are very, they're, they're following the, the rules of um, picturesque painting in lots of ways. There's a there's a there's a scene of water receding into the distance. There's a um, gothic figure on a rock in the foreground that sort of draws your eye into the picture. There's reflection. There's water. There's foliage. Um, so some of them are crouched in 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 that in that way, but others are very different. Um, and that's one of the things that um, one of the things that the technology uh, sort of. What the excitement around stereoscopic technology was that illusion of three dimensions, um, and the advice given to photographers using this technology was to was to make photographs that accentuated the three the, th the sort of three dimensional aspect. You, you've probably all been to you know three dimensional films, and you 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 get that sense of there are sort of effects with just for the creative you know the idea of something coming towards you you know that that, that they're done simply to dramatize that technological effect. And there are certain things that you can see that Chapman does in order to accentuate. So he will quite often pose uh, either natural landscape features or individuals, uh, in this case, human subjects, uh, in a in a sort of receding um, arrangement so that the viewer of the photograph will. And this is an example here. Um, it's fields of, of um, plants, but you've got four men posed in slightly or slightly further afield. But at a distance, and that, that's to, that's deliberately um, to play with that with that technology. Um, there are other points where it's simply a kind of observational device. They're both taking photographs of uh, botanical specimens. In this case, a, um, a, a a rare plant, which they take photographs of, and they send their photographs and the sketches to um, uh, to, to Kew Gardens. Uh, to Sir Joseph Hooker because again they're trying to um, win their reputation as as being uh, as being explorers with look, looking with um, with a scientific eye uh, at specimens. Um, so there are some ways in which photographing a uh, photograph photography is really useful. So um, the artist Baines complains that it takes him all day to make a sketch, a good botanic, suitably botanical uh, sketch of a plant. Um, whereas James Chapman can photograph it, you know, in in a in a few minutes. But then on the other hand, Chapman will complain that he he tries to take photographs of of, of these fields of plants, but the wind is too strong, uh, and his he he tries for three days to take photographs of these little, these little white sort of carnation type plants, um, and and has to give up in the end uh, and fails. Whereas Thomas Baines can do a sketch quite quickly and with a watercolor, um, and Baines can also identify different parts of a of a plant can sort of dissect it and can kind of show in, in more detail different parts of the of, of the plant. Um, some botanic specimens uh, also are, are much easier to photograph than others. So in the end, 
Chapman gives up and says he's just going to go photograph trees. He's had enough photographing uh, flowers because it's too it's too time consuming, too too complicated. Um, so he takes lot. There are lots of photographs of trees, uh, which again useful to you can't you can't easily transport trees, you know, specimens back to Kew. That's a, a lot of um, a lot of effort. But whereas taking a photograph, you can show quite quickly the scale, the, the size, the shape, um, those sorts of elements. But things like seeds and leaves, you can you can actually collect physically. Um, so he, he again, he, he creates some, uh, he takes notes about these products. Also, they take lots of photographs of uh, animals. Um, some of these are hunting trophies. They, they are, of course, having to kill animals all the time as they go for food. Um, that's how they survive in large part. Um, hunting uh, is, a, is a massive colonial, a, a massive industry here. For, it's how, how many of the different groups are surviving. But he also takes photographs of um, dead animals with a scientific eye as well. In this case, he's arranged the dead zebra specifically to show that the kinds of stripes. And um, he has a claim that this is a new kind of zebra. Um, and in fact, does get his name mentioned in the in the, the classification of this of this species in the end um, because of his, his claims around around the, 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 the um, this species of zebra. Um, there are lots of photographs of, again, dead animals. In this case, this is um, a dead rhinoceros, which and, and you can see um, the, uh, the the artist Thomas Baines in the foreground to the left, uh, who's who's sketching it. So you get to see sketches of the of the photographer and photographs of of the artist. In a way, they're they're possibly sort of. Uh, I think in this case, uh, the photographer is evidencing the fact that the artist was actually there. Uh, and, and vice versa, they you know they sort of take it in turns to document each other's uh, presence in this landscape. Again, lots of there's plenty of examples of um, uh, of elephants, all kinds of other other animals. They also make photographs of different groups of, of people. Um, they're very keen to map out the different ethnic um, ethnic groups that they encounter. Uh, and I think the 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 thing that is quite interesting when you look at the collection of um, photographs of of of, uh, of people they encounter is the um, the different ways in which different groups of people are depicted. There is not there isn't a solitary kind of colonial mindset here. Um, there is there are elements of a kind of anthropological gaze where people are posed rather like mugshots um, with a, with a view to anthrop to being useful for, to anthropology. But there are others um, that are far more sort of in, in, in individuated. Um, so the one of the things they 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 do is make uh, is, is have captions. Uh, they make comments about the um, the living condition, wh where where groups of people live, how they live, uh, what they subsist on, what what their what their character um, what their character is, and so on, which is a kind of anthropological um, anthropological gaze. Um, so I'm just trying to think what the so so the caption here um, that that Baines talked about is um, he 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 talks about them being an inferior tribe, somewhat approximating the Bushmen in their habits and physical appearance, but living generally near the beach, subsisting chiefly on fish. So so he's kind of mapping um, these different different um, groups. It's very much a kind of colonial um, project. So these kinds of uh, white exploration uh these kind of white explorer accounts are um that chapman and baines were both schooled in um theory of human character uh for of the time uh, how human character could be read from uh from the body uh drawing on phonology physiognomy ethnology um and and art so um these kinds of pictures are very carefully posed subjects have clearly been arranged in front of the camera um sometimes you're not clear the condition the reasons how how they were um how they were posed uh whether they were paid or anything like that is not always is not always clear sometimes there is evidence that people resisted and didn't want to be photographed and and that that is sometimes commented upon um and um uh, the artist james chapman uh, sorry uh, thomas baines is also very keen to um to uh, uh to document people other times they um, they're interested to kind of make distinctions between people. This is a um, a, a photograph of um, 
um, what they call princesses at the lake and their guardians or slaves. So they're distinguishing between different um, groups of uh, groups of, of, of people. Um, and the, the photograph at the, on the bottom, you probably can't see, but there's a group of uh, men who are arranged. They are um, in, in one photograph, they're, they're facing one direction and in the other, they're facing another direction. So it's a kind of um, very much attuned to the kind of ethnographic um, standard of, of, of the time. Um, in other cases, they take photographs of their guides, um, people who are helping them, who are part of their expedition. Um, and they're keen to um, they're keen to kind of record that. Uh, and so in other cases, you can see a very deliberate crossover where photographs have been used by the artist to later to, uh, to, to, to kind of make very careful observations of of different um, people and um, their, uh, their their material culture um, in, in a more kind of studied way. Um, that this is an example of where there's a way that where you can see a very close link between the photographs and and paintings. Um, other captions, um, and this is where you can come back and see where the stereoscopic emphasis has been deliberately um, arranged. That the, these these are a group of women with um, um, transporting um, buckets of water or, or or carrying things on their heads, and they've again been arranged not in, not in a in a in a line all at the same distance they've been like de deliberately arranged in a in a sequence so that the stereoscopic effect of the photograph is um is enhanced um and then other times um they're very alive to social hierarchies so they photograph um in this case a a chief um near lake ngami um, who's obviously a, a man of some standing who they have to negotiate with in order to travel through this territory and in this case, they take a photograph of him um, uh, in in a way that indicates his social his social standing um, in that in in that group, and and their their caption um, kind of um, in, indicates some of that. And then other, in other captions, they they do the similar thing here, where they have a um, a, a chief called Chief Amral and his counselors, the elders of a of a, of a church. So it's a Christian um, community, and they photograph the. Uh, the chief with his uh, surrounded by his elders. So there's a different kind of mode of using the camera uh, in this kind of in this sort of circumstance. And there are um, other document to other areas where they're photographing um, settlements. And um, this is an example here of where they document uh, a group of of young girls uh, with with their Bibles. You can't quite see, but they are holding Bibles and the church in the background. So there's a there's a kind of narrative here of Christianization and uh, and kind of enculturation uh, as well that, that happens in in the course of their of their photographs. So I'm going to um, sort of bring things to a bit more of a close now. I've talked a bit about the way in which they use um, the photographers use the, the camera. Uh, Jane Chapman uses his camera to uh, photograph landscape, animals, human, peoples in, in in different ways. Um, uh, the last part of the the um, the longer version of this paper uh, tries to then think about what happens to the photographs and how they get displayed, um, because they they're obviously made. He's making these photographs with a uh, both a scientific and a popular audience in mind. He clearly has a view of making some money, um, but he also wants his wants to be recognised as being useful to science. So he sent his photographs to his patron, Sir George Gray, uh, and then on to the Royal Geographical Society. Um, he also made a decision uh, some years later in 1865 to have his photographs printed and marketed by a Cape Town photographer called James Kirkman. Uh, although I've not managed to find what sales figures, uh, what, 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 how successful they were. Um, his largest international audience seems to have been reached in um, 1865, when 140 photographs by uh, Chapman J of Cape Town um, of what was in quote scenery, wild animals and plants were exhibited at the International Exhibition in Paris um, as part of the exhibition of the Cape of Good Hope, um, which which was in, was one of um, the displays of British colonies and dependencies at, at the International Exhibition. 
Uh, I don't know exactly what photographs were exhibited, except, as I said, that they were of scenery, wild animals and plants. So that, that seems to indicate that there weren't necessarily um, humans depicted, but you, you, you don't, you don't, you don't really, it's not really clear. There's not a list. I haven't got a list of photographs. Um, but they also had photographic proofs and apparatus, a whole range of categories um, in, in, the, uh, in this exhibition. Um, and there was everything on display uh, alongside, um, there were three other Cape Town photographers work displayed. Um, but also lots and lots of I, you can't quite see here, but this is a map of the of the exhibition itself. Um, and there are various there's a, there's a grand plan of the universal exhibition. So you can see different different countries here. So uh, different European places. Um, and I'm just looking for where. Great Britain and you can see Z. So where Z is on that map, I can't remember. Uh, you can see the going around. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but it's a, it's a, you know, it's a big. The world, the world as exhibition, basically. You can tra travel the world uh, in the space of this big international exhibition. But the photographs are displayed. So Chapman's photographs are alongside three other Cape Town-based photographers, and they are there with everything from paintings, printing books, paper stationery, maps, geographical cosmological apparatus. Fancy furniture goes on a massive list of things, leather and skins, uh, fatty substances used as food, um, meat and fish, vegetables and fruit, um, sugar and confectionery, fermented drinks, useful insects. I, li I like that. Useful insects, um, uh, horticulture. It, it goes on. So they, the photographs are part of these other sort of colonial objects, if, if you like, on, on display. Um, and as a visitor, you could sort of take this tour around a sort of distilled colonial world where objects would, were divorced from the environment from which they came and reorganized according to a European logic of, of, um, of commodity capitalism. Um, displayed in this setting, Chapman's photographs of landscapes, plants, animals um, were encountered in places far removed from their original environments, uh, far removed even from Cape Town, let alone uh, Paris. Um, they work as mobile traces accumulated and redeployed in colonial and metropolitan centres of calcula calculation. They operate in parallel to the other objects around them, from displays of insects, indigenous weapons and elephant tusks, as slices of colonial reality transported and transformed into a kind of colonial geography lesson. Um, so uh, I'm very interested then in, in, in conclusion in how um, how these photographs uh, operate. They they were clearly not intended to stand alone as works of art. They were sort of practical, um, part of practical expeditions of science designed, designed to complement other observations and uh, to sit, sit alongside a raft of other, of other observational information about this terrain uh, and their inhabitants. They weren't sort of disinterested um, observations. They were part of and they were made and circulated uh, and displayed within an expanding um, colonial economy. Um, and they carry that kind of momentum of conquest and commerce and civilization uh, in that way. They, the photographs were, were marketed in numbered series along with printed titles and captions. So they kind of um, constitute in that way a narrative of, of the sort of march through, through landscape, the onward push of, uh, uh, into, new, into new territory. So, so I'm interested in them in that way, but I think thinking about them in terms of this the photography complex, what I tried to do in the, in the longer paper is to appreciate their role as dynamic um, and complex tools of empire, uh, opening up the territory alongside other kinds of uh, objects and technologies. Um, I think it also helps in, in doing that, helps us understand the ways in which the operation of the camera and the labour of the photographer was situated in a complex environment in which outcomes were not necessarily easily anticipated. Different social groups and individuals within this territory um, ex exerted different degrees of agency in shaping the uh, photographic output. Um, the practice of Chapman's photograph photography was designed to capture and project knowledge for colonial science um, and the the pictorial space of the stereoscopic view 
uh, invited viewers to roam freely across this imaginative of terrain to discover it for them for themselves. Um, and as I've said, many of Chapman's photographs were, were made deliberately in order to um, sort of maximize the three, three dimensional spatial effect, layering different elements um, of the photograph. But a number of the photographs uh, also don't don't really work. Um, I'm not sure why I had this photograph here. I'm not, um, so a, a number of the photographs don't necessarily work so well. Um, either they weren't suitable as um, images or they've been uh, poorly pasted into uh, I I into into cards. Um, there are quite a number of photographs survive as single, just as single photographs. Um, so you clearly can't see them in 3D uh, if you if they're just a single photograph or they're pasted onto a big card where you can't put them into a stereoscopic viewer. I also don't think the display of the photographs at the International Exhibition was likely to have been in stereoscopic. They would have probably been under glass. Um, I, I don't actually I don't know how they were displayed, but it's unlikely given that's a big exhibition to. I know there were some technologies that allowed people to view stereoscopic you know, you could take it in turns and, and look at stereoscopic um, photographs with a viewer, but in a big international exhibition, it's unlikely uh, that that was that was available. Um, so that kind of undermines the use of that technology in a way, or at least it kind of um, it makes it it more um, com complex. Um, my my last point is that then the photographs were not merely symbolic visualizations of how colonialism was transforming African environments into natural resources um, for the production of commodities in a global market. They were they were elements in a technological complex shaped um, shaped by uh, and shaping colonial modernity. Um, like the 900 kilos of ivory that Chapman shipped out of Albus Bay back to Cape Town at the end of his expedition, the photographs themselves were could be thought of as a kind of form of colonial extraction designed for a colonial audience and market in Cape Town and beyond. Um, so the photographs aren't simply representing this commodity frontier, they are also actively uh, constituting it. But I don't. I think it's quite easy to overdetermine the instrumentality of, photo of these photographs as kind of colonial weapons. Um, I, I think as, in some respects, they, um, th they offer in their sort of pure form a very solitary experience, this multi-layered um, evocation of place, um, which is rather different to how they were shown in, a, in an international exhibition where they were more sort of representative of, of a British cl of colony. Um, so so the, the meaning, their meaning then depends really very much on, on how they were, how they were, how they were projected and how, how they were uh, played. Um, but I think there are some contradictions here in, in the uh, in the operation of of the of photography, in that um, many colonial survey photographs of this era, both in Africa and in in North America, um, convey the logic of of terra nullis, the idea that um, uncultivated vacant land was rightfully available to colonization. Um, but um, the these photographs actually don't depopulate the landscape because quite a few paintings at the time do they just sort of rendered it empty and vacant but uh, and as did maps of course often you know no, there's very little human presence um but photographs actually his photographs in particular are very rooted to the ground they, they're full of people full of different kinds of people um and um uh, unlike a lot of the survey photographs of the american west they 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 show this landscape to be uh, an active multi-layered multi-ethnic um contested terrain and and when you read them alongside his books that's very much the the picture you get of a, of a kind of lively active contested terrain in which the explorers are are are, are sort of visitors not always welcome uh, either but for the visitors charting chart um uh, sort of encountering a, a, a new space i will stop there sorry i went on a little bit uh, we were a bit late starting weren't we yes oh i close you might want to plug in <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I'm all tied. I'm trapped. I'm tied, I'm, tied, I'm tied up with cable. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
it. Well, I think we'll start with questions from the floor, first of all. <laughs> okay. yes. So just before we go with uh, questions, actually, if any colleagues of teams are interested with the stereoscopic uh, device, I put one in my office. Okay. We spoke about parts like that from New York. That's what you did by people just here. So if you want to experience this idea of 3D and things like that, please come to my office. Uh, I can uh, I've got one of these uh, oh, right. imitation of devices. I have one, but I should have brought it. I should have brought it with me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's actually, it does work. I mean, yeah. it's in the 19th century way. Yeah. It does. It does work. It's, yeah. uh, it's quite uh, impressive in a way. The technology thinking of this idea of 3Ds from 19th century is yeah. quite because uh, it's. Not very long after the patterns were discovered. Yeah. I mean, yes. 1839, I mean, we were yeah. only like 20, 25 years later. Yeah. Yeah. When you think about it, it's very, very quick. And, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, anyway. So, what is the point in that really interesting when you likened it to the Disney viewers? Yes. I think as a kid, it's, it's a gimmick. It's yes. A gimmick. Yeah. Like well, it's about um, bringing bringing the remote to the present, and 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 so it's part of uh, of a broader excitement around photography. That photography has this ability, um, you know, very quickly from its foundation in the late eighteen thirties, to transport people uh, without without. It's a virtual travel, you know, armchair travel, and you can bring the world. Uh, to to people's um, front front parlors, you know, Victorian parlors. So the, the the stereoscope is an is a kind of enhancement of of the excitement around just of uh, different kinds of photographic technology, it basically. So so it's it's it, but it allows the illusion of being immersed in a in a space of actually being in the space because it closes off the spectator. You're not just looking at a a, 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 a photograph a, a scene. You are immersed in in it. It's much more immersive. In a similar way to say, like vloggers that keep, uh, have films that we. Yeah, well, it's, it's probably it's like the, the augmented reality, or the or the or the, or the, the idea that people will will. Um, want a, a Google headset and and mm. and walk wander around. You know, I mean, I, 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 you know, I think um, the whole notion of Meta's idea of, of um, what the world that we, you were meant to be going to inhabit, I, I don't think it'll work because actually, ever since from the Victorians, people, it's a bit of a pain to have to have goggles or, or a viewer. It's a pain. People don't want to go to cinema and have goggles. And I don't, likewise, I, that's why I think Meta is doomed because it, there's a basic thing there that's a pain it's, a, it's annoying uh, to have to as a as a spectator and it's also an, it's a solid uh, it's a more solitary mm -hmm. pursuit as well whereas uh viewing photographs in, a, in an exhibition or going to the cinema um is a shared a shared uh there's a shared social element to that so um but but it's um i think it's a novelty definitely trying wanting wanting to sell um, the idea, but the immersive quality of the space. There's a there's a great book on stereoscopic. Well, there's a great book on um, includes stereoscopic photography by an art historian called Jonathan Crary. And it's it's been an old book now. It's from the late 1990s, I think. Um, and he he it's called Techniques of the Observer, and he argues that um, the the history of stereoscopic technology, along with a load of other sort of visual novelties in the 19th century. Uh, has been too. It's been collapsed along with photography. It should be separated. He argues because fundamentally, it's a very, it's a totally different way of engaging with um, a, a, a visualization because of the, the nature of the act. It positions the spectator in a different way to the, to the photograph. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask. That's yeah. Well, that's. That's it's supposed to uh, in the and the comment the comments at the time there are there are lots of comment commentators talk about um sort of floating in a dream like way there's a, a great American uh, a commentator called, called Oliver Wendell Holmes who writes a fantastic essay about the stereoscope um and about how you can kind of dream, float through it, it's, it's a dream it's a it, the analogy with dreams is is mentioned it you it's because you are 
somehow separated from your your current space and you you are that you you're meant to literally feel transported into this other space but but it's i, I think there's a an element of um people have to suspend their disbelief in in you know there, i don't know there, there is a there's a, a kind of imaginative dimension to that and the dislocation from your surroundings also in some ways undermines the, the project so lots of stereoscopic cards had captions on the bottom and then and then a text on the back mm -hmm. so they go into mass production um and they're about you know something like a hundred thousand being a year being churned out um by the london stereoscopic um company in the early 1860s you know they're, they're, it goes into mass and you can still you can there's a whole collecting if you you know look on ebay you can pick up stereoscopic cards now all over the world you know sort of virtual virtual tourism you can still collect them as a, a market yeah just to carry on with that so of course the idea of the armchair tourist yes and the idea of going around uh it's interesting because so in india for example james richardson uses this kind of processes by the 1870s and 80s but it's very based on the tourist market yeah. and the idea is also being very patriotic so it's very showing lots of british buildings being built in india and the idea that uh, one of famous ones is uh the pictures of uh, certain historical pictures of the um, train station in Bombay. Yes. And say uh, the most beautiful uh, station in the world. Yeah. You know, very popular. The British have done that. Yes. And it is the idea that someone in Britain can be in India and be very part of the empire and be proud of being empire by that. But from what you were saying, and I don't know, if, and showing, I don't know, if, because of the landscape, and they are exploring, yes. you don't have much of uh, any. Um, colonial buildings or there is very much still about the populations or the landscape there. Yeah. So do you think that when it comes to perhaps sell the project, the empire project, yes. uh, it's a bit different from when you establish colonial cities, for example. So how would you read that at that time for with the ideas, especially with yeah. the sense of, of giving the, the vision to being yes. part of the project? Uh, well, I think there's, there's the, the um, you have to um the, the context uh at the time for uh the desire and appetite for narratives of exploration was 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 very good i mean david livingston's book um about his um uh, expedition in in africa which had been published in 1859 was a was a bestseller you know it sold sold you know it, it sold over 70,000 copies and it was a publishing sensation so there's a there's a huge appetite in that um, and that was about um that wasn't about sort of sort of fantastic colonial architecture it was about a project of encountering difference mm. but of civilization and christian christianization and extending commerce so so there was a there was an ex expeditionary sort of it was a, that romance of um encountering the unknown and and also of pity it was very there's a very kind of um gendered element to that it's it's you it, you know it's, it's white men pitting themselves against hostile environments and climate um, and uh, and hostile people um, and and sort of surviving and, and coming through it. So so there's a very strong that that narrative is of, of colonial conquest and encounter is strong. But um, there are different there are obviously differences because at the same time, photography is being used uh, in exactly the kind of projects you talked about at the same time in the 1860s. There are photographers in Canada, uh, for example, documenting, you know, the great, great um, uh, colonial settler cities uh, as they're sort of, you know, and, and um, uh, the kind of key signs of civilization. So colleges, law, law courts, um, uh, colonial governors, um, residences and so on um, being, being so, so that's being celebrated and sold. Mm. Um, not I yeah there are stereoscopic views being generated of of that uh, as well but this is yeah so this is slightly different I think this is the narrow narrative of not so much tour tourist activity this is very much a, an encounter with the unknown um, mm. and it's trading on that that element thank you very much really interesting talk I was fascinated by this idea of the painter and the photographer working alongside each other. So you've got, I think you said, 
Baines painting a sculpted picture, yeah. the photographer taking a picture of the painter. Yeah. And obviously, the two are kind of complementing, supplementing, and yeah. enriching each other. I just yeah. wondered what happened to the paintings. I mean, were the paintings displayed alongside the, the, the photographs, or did the painting, you know, what was the kind of afterlife? Mm. Of the paintings. So the, the paintings had a much a much more successful afterlife than the photographs in lots of ways. Um, I mean, it 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 um, Thomas Baines was a was a by all accounts quite a difficult character, and he fell out with people. Um, and uh, I think there's some speculation now by biographers and, and art historians that that he he was. Um, he might have been autistic uh, in 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 terms of the, the the kind of interpretation of his character. He wasn't he wasn't great sort of social social interactions. His great advocate was his mother, um, and she championed his work. And um, even after he his his death, she really promoted his reputation. She wrote to the Royal Geographical Society, um, and in fact, the Royal Geographical Society did buy a lot of his paintings. Um, and for many years, they were displayed. Uh, on the walls inside the Royal Geographical Society. Some, some of them, they are still, but when the when the Royal Geographical Society realised um, a couple of decades ago just how valuable they were, they they put copies up, <laughs> and the originals are are locked away somewhere. Um, or they or the, the ones that are on display are displayed in much more secure environments because they were just they were just kind of on the literally on the walls. But they become highly collectible because of of a, a kind of the art the art world. Um, because of the quality of the work is exceptionally um, exceptionally good. He's exceptionally clever as a at capturing detail. Um, they're very very finely observed. Um, they're quite a good size as well. The, the paintings um, they're not absolutely huge, but but they they're obviously bigger than the, than the photographs, and the colour is really vibrant as as well. So so he 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 kind of forges a. Um, uh, the, the the kind of style of them is very observational, very detailed, but they're very style stylistic as well. They're very carefully composed um, for for the kind of colour and the. Um, he's very good at capturing kind of action. Um, so so the paintings have a a more successful after they're exhibited a number of occasions, um, and as I said, they they're acquired by the institution, and they have a currency that's. Um, that's kind of lasted and over time they've become highly you know they've become valuable the the photographs uh it's 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 rather different they sort of rather rather disappeared uh, no one knows what happened to the negatives um from from them so in that sense all that survives is our various versions the, the prints um and there are different there, there are, uh, the biggest collection is in uh, the national library in south africa in cape town um, but because they're they're small and they they have this kind of uh, co commercial sort of rather murky commercial because he he traded the license to sell them to another uh, another photographer in Cape Town um, and he he obviously he went on to do a whole range of other things to 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 be a um, you know he he was a he tried his hand at all sorts of all sorts of activities whereas for Thomas Baines he was that he was an artist. That he made his living out, out of art, whereas I don't think James Chapman really made much of a living out of the photographs. It wasn't, yeah. So they have a diff very different currency. We'd see the both now. Yeah. Artists, wouldn't we? But it's the kind of reason the artist phones, I presume, rather look down at this kind of technology that we saw. I think, yeah. Different. Yeah, it's interesting. There is comment. There is comment. He does make comments, and sometimes he complains. And I think I think there are moments where he's sort of thinking, "This is going to do me out of a job." But then I think he realizes actually that the the painter can do has a whole load of um, more uh, opportunities. Um, can can be more more isn't tied to the ground in the same isn't and and also isn't struggling with the, the camera. I mean, Baines can do wonders just with a, a pencil and a piece of paper. Um, and he's always, always sketching. Uh, whereas Chapman is is has to has to well, he gets other people to carry it, but he is also himself lugging chemicals. He's very dependent on water, and um, he he's, he spends a huge amount of time 
unsuccessfully um, trying to make it's a very complicated process trying to make the photograph so he he's not always successful and the images he takes and do not always um produce the effects that he he wants so so I think Baines does. I don't know if he looks down on it um, as a medium, but I think he realizes it's not it's not for him. But he he clearly uses it to help him uh, as a device for mem sort of for, for recording certain things because he he there are, you can see some of similarities. Um, but uh, yeah, he doesn't he doesn't make photographs in, in himself. Either. I mean, I was going to ask you about uh, portraits and so on yeah. because. They often at that time, they, because of the chemicals, the roughly the old materials. I mean, I know, for example, someone born in, in India in the 60s was always commenting they had to have 40 yes. uh, carriers around him. So it's funny yeah. really because, of course, all the images are like nearly empty and just there, there but yeah. actually, you have nearly an army of, uh, yeah. of helpers behind carrying all of it. So, roughly, how many people? I mean, were they getting. Uh, it's uh, not as many as 40. They, mm -hmm. they, have, they have at least two, possibly three wagons. And sometimes you see the wagons in the in the photographs. Um, it's a relative a lot of a lot of where they're crossing is a relatively um, that the train is 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 not is is um, it's possible for wagons, but obviously they they need to use the main the main route route ways that wagons can uh, can can traverse. So um, uh, so they they're not reliant on on everything being carried by uh, individual porters. Uh, they can use, uh, they, at least for, for a large part of their journey, they can use um, horses and, and wagons. Um, so they, they do do that. I would say that they have a sort of retinue of um, five or six um, people. It's not, it's not huge. That's a good question, actually, exactly how many. But they, they seem to have, they seem to employ different people at different points. Uh, and and they have a job. Sometimes they they lose everybody. You know, everyone leaves. or they, So they, they have to then hire a load of other people. And, so that that's a dynamic kind of process, but they are totally. I mean, without that, I mean they're very experienced um, travelers. Both of them have spent years and years um, and uh, in in this kind of pursuit. So, but even then, they they wouldn't survive very long. Uh, they're in, they're traveling particularly around the the, the, the desert. Um, it's a very arid environment. You know, they 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 are absolutely dependent on. People who live and travel through that territory to help them to get the water, and so there's a lot of negotiation that has to go on all the time mm. about about you know they can shoot animals to feed people to then get water, or you know there's lots of negotiation on it. So, yeah. Any question? This is all one group I find that there was no government backing, which I'm assuming the British government. Yes. And exactly their original aim was to effectively traverse the continent. Yeah. Uh, in other words, to reach presumably what people are now calling those are big. Yeah. Yeah. So I would like to say perhaps a little bit beyond your unit. Yeah. One, did they ever go beyond Lake Victoria? And two, if they did, what were the reactions of, say, Portuguese, maybe even followers of the Yeah, they, they, they didn't make it in the end. They didn't get as far. They had to, they had to kind of stop. Um, so they got they got to the Zambi to the Zambezi, but they didn't make it all all the way across. I can't remember now where they. I think they just head down the Zambezi, but I don't. They 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 go their separate ways. In the end, and Chapman heads back to Cape. Uh, I can't remember. I'm afraid what happens to Thomas where Thomas Baines go. He think he goes off and joins another expedition, but they they don't completely fulfil their um, their intention. Uh, to do that, so uh, yeah, it's a good question. I, 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 yeah, I'm sure I can't remember where they where, where it ends up. As you rightly say, yes, yeah. not doesn't seem as well as confusing the distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, second question. Yeah, you, yeah. I'm thinking about the photographs. Um, now you mentioned that uh, they they were collectors. And yes, presumably they these individual collectors collected. Um, later on, yeah. It's a really good question. I've not seen them as postcards, um, and the ones that survive in um, there are different holdings. There's there's some that survive in Cape Town Library, uh, and there are others that survive in uh, in Johannesburg 
um, in, a, in a library um, uh, in in Johannesburg. I think it was it was called the Africa Museum. Uh, I don't know if it might have changed its name, but that um, they 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 are stereoscopic slide. They are mounted on stereoscopic cards, so um, they seem to be as uh, as they were um, printed and sold in in Cape Town uh, by a commercial photographer. I've not found any evidence of them being later reused as as posters. Uh, I suspect because because as time as time went on, the sort of appetite for the views was was taken over by um, by, by other things. So I I don't know that I think the ephemeral nature of things like postcards means that lots of them don't survive. But um, but then they were produced in such postcards as you you know were produced in such huge quantities that. Um, you would have thought perhaps if they were printed as postcards, there would be they might crop up. But I've not, I've never seen a postcard. Yeah, nineteen hundreds. There once would be nine, but this is this was almost looking back. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, it's a good question. I I haven't seen them produced in that in that in that way. Um, I have. Seen, I mean, they have cropped up in um, uh, in books on the history of uh, of photography in South Africa, um, but then only only used. You know, um, it, you know, just one or two of them would be used um, in in that. But I haven't seen them produced. I haven't seen them have any kind of afterlife, um, really, apart from uh, the, the original stereoscopic photographs. And as I said, I I I don't know what kind of a what kind of an output they had at the time, how how successful or otherwise they were. Um, they, you know, they they were not cheap necessarily to produce um, stereoscopic slides because you, 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 the, the, the photographs had to be mounted on the on, glued onto cards. Um, they, they, they could have been, but there was a certain amount of um, labor involved in in generating those. So I think it would I suspect it would have not had a huge output. I I haven't seen any evidence that they were bought by the big companies, that though the stereoscopic London stereoscopic company was one, and then in America the Keystone Keystone View company bought up loads of stock. But they tended to use commercial photographers whose work was much more sort of glossy and professional looking. Whereas I think a lot of this would have been not you know, it might have been useful for, for people who knew something about it, but uh, it wasn't produced completely in that sort of more, you know, it's not the sort of views of Niagara Falls or it's not quite as touristy as um, much more specialised. Yeah. One is scholastic. Yeah. And the other, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's probably why it it, it, it didn't work. And I think the scholastic, the, the sort of scholarly audience um, invariably didn't have the money. The Royal Geographical Society was notoriously always hard up and, and not willing to buy things. It was very welcome to have donations, thank you, you know, to its library. And that's how it acquired most of its photographs. It did purchase, sometimes it would buy uh, things, but it was reluctant um, to spend any money uh, if it could have possibly uh, avoided. And it was spending a lot of money on, on maps, uh, making its own maps. Um, it was reluctant to buy buy photographs when it could get donated. But with that, actually, that's interesting because same case in France with the uh, Société Géographie de France, yeah. where you have uh, photographs from the 1860s yeah. donated to them because they want yeah. the, the photographers in the Sahara or North Africa. They want to make sure that their work will have posterity. They will be recognised by being mm. kept somewhere. So there are donations sometimes just to yes. from the photographer just to make sure that their name can remain somewhere. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's true. I, I think some of those organisations um, that, that rely on membership fees to keep going, um, that, that they are much they're much harder. They rely on their donations. But there are some uh, there are some exceptions when the, the uh, archive planets uh, mm -hmm. in in Paris. Where you had a very wealthy um, philanthropist who decide um, to uh, sponsor uh, commercial photographers to document uh, 
sort of scenes around the world and they put it into a huge archive and and that, that so the archive to the, the, the to that planet was um was kind of created uh with a, with a, a kind of geographical project behind it it was funded by a swiss uh, banker um and he paid professional photographers sort of um armies of them to go out and photograph sort of characteristic scenes of the world uh, and, uh, and using particular um color, color photography, photography in particular and then amassed it all back in a sort of central archive so that but that was a rather different um very expensive project to do but the, the often the geographical societies were their sort of scholarly projects were they were much they were spending much more money on their journals and their maps photographs but as i said they were kind of acquired slightly by accident in some ways <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thanks a lot for a very interesting talk and questions afterwards. And we'll thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, well, thank you for all the patience with all the technical okay, problems. Yeah. And uh, just to tell to, we have another talk coming on the 20th of uh, March. It's going to be followed with a round table about uh, the, the title is migration why it matters so please uh, come and join us and uh, again thank you very much and i, and I think i'll stop the, the recording here